Yeah, I was saying, I almost said good morning. I did a last service where I was like, good morning. Holy cow, it's four o'clock. It's not morning. Um, yeah, so tonight we're talking about the, the pure in heart. Um, and to be honest, like yesterday, Lucas and I were talking. He's like, you got your sermon done? I was like, yeah, bless other peacemakers. He's like, no. <laughs> I was like, oh, what is it? <laughs> Blessed are the pure in heart. So uh, basically, I woke up this morning and I just started writing, and here's what we have. So if you've seen me preach before, you know it's going to be chaotic and fun. So um, let's have some fun with it. But I love the Beatitudes. I love them. Um, and context is key. Does anyone know that? Context is key. Who Jesus is speaking to, where they're at, that kind of stuff. So ready for this? I've given a sermon before to a congregation where I could barely breathe because the cigarette smoke was so thick. They were a lively bunch drinking liquor and beer as I preached with amens being shouted more often than needed. So some of you guys are probably sitting there thinking like, that's a lively Sunday crowd. Some of you may be thinking, I know he worked with homeless people. Maybe it's those people he's talking about. It's neither. It was some college kids in Florida that asked me to speak at their frat house one time when I was homeless. They're like, they wanted to know why a guy would abandon everything in pursuit of Jesus and hanging out with the poor. See, context is key. See, if we think that that Sunday crowd is the people I'm talking to, we miss who I'm talking to, right? Then immediately we start judging them like, I would never go to that church. That sounds like a terrible place. Or maybe some of you guys are like, what's the address for that place? Like, let's go. <laughs> That's a bad thing. Don't do that. See, context is crucial because when we figure out who Jesus is speaking to, we can oftentimes understand what he's trying to say. But if we just remove all that, we lose a lot of the meat and potatoes. So tonight we're talking about the Beatitudes. And I like to think we're microscoping in. You guys remember science projects? You would microscope in and look on something. And that's what we're doing tonight. We're studying really one verse in the Bible. And I was telling this, the service before this, one of my least favorite things in the Bible is when they invented chapters and verses. See, I think in stories. I can't remember verses. Do you realize that chapters and verses didn't even come around until the 13th century? It's a long time. Before then, people knew stories and they sang liturgical songs. And the thing is, really, the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount, the most beautiful sermon ever preached, ever ready for this, it ends in chapter 8. And it begins at the end of chapter 4. It's this huge thing, and oftentimes we look at a verse or two and we're like, oh, that's what he was saying. Well, you missed the whole sermon. That'd be like if you guys walked out right now and be like, he was talking about booze. You missed everything that I was about to say. And the thing, what I'm saying is, yes, we're studying one small portion of what Jesus' sermon is. But it's a small portion because the things we talked about last week, the merciful, and next week, the peacemakers, and after that, the persecution, it has everything to do with the other verse. It's all interwoven. And so we don't have tons, tons of time, so I'm going to try getting through this. Ready for this? Matthew 5, 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. I've heard this sermon a million times. And as a young man, I still remember. And really the takeaway for me every time was like, well, let's just be good Christians. And that's it. But now as I get older, I understand context. And I understand who's there. It changes the story. Because like I said, this sermon begins in chapter 4 at the end. I want you to listen to this because I'm about to tell you who's listening to this sermon. Jesus went through Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria. And people brought to him all those with various illnesses and various diseases, such as those suffering with severe pain, the demon possessed, oh. those having seizures, and the paralyzed, and he healed them. A lot of people. Luke even gives accounts of three different specific times before this point where he heals a demon-possessed guy, a leper, and then some other guy. In Matthew, in Matthew 8, the last thing Jesus does when he comes off the mountainside is he heals a leper that was up there. 
So we know lepers are there in this sermon. And check this out. 425, right before, this is why I hate verses and chapters. Large crowds from Galilee and Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region all across from the Jordan followed him. And here's where chapter 5 comes, and we miss these people. If you don't believe me, read it. Chapter 5 begins this. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. See, if we just jump into chapter 5, we don't realize those crowds are basically the wounded, the disabled, and the outcasts. The interesting thing, Matthew says, and his disciples came to him and he began to teach them. Luke tells us, and his crowds of disciples came to him. So I think Jesus was talking to everybody. And the interesting thing is the paralyzed are there. And I was telling the right before this is how did the paralyzed get on a mountainside? I bet their friends brought them. How did the lepers get there? I bet they had a crutch together holding each other to get there because they heard about some good news finally. And once again, we could stop there and pat ourselves on the back and say, okay, let's just be better Christians. But what is said in this little sentence is so huge. Ready for this? I may break your heart. Jesus wasn't speaking or even thinking about middle class America when he said these words. Oh, (laughs) he was speaking into a Jewish society where the Romans ruled, where Pax Romana, this Roman peace, the most brutal thing the world had ever seen, brought about peace through brutality. Where all across, I think it was my first week here, I was talking about how crucifixion was the norm. And I'm sure the gust of wind on the mountainside would hit and you could smell the rotting bodies. And all these people broken, outcasts, the lepers, the paralyzed, even the demon-possessed are sitting there like, help us. And I'm sure the religious elite were there as well. The Roman soldiers making sure nothing got out of hand. And in this moment, in this tension, the most beautiful sermon ever was spoken. If you get a chance, read it all. Don't look at the verses. Don't look at the chapters. Just read it. Consume it. Because in this, blessed are the pure in heart. So, once again, Jewish society, let me tell you something about these people. They believed if you were diseased, a leper, a paralyzed person, you did something to deserve that. You were sinful. So they immediately cast you over there and say, there's something wrong with you. You did something. You're bad. And not only that, but the temple and the law requirements required people to make sacrifices, whether a goat, a lamb, or if you were super poor, maybe a pigeon or a sparrow or something. But here's the thing. In a shame-honor society, based and consumed with cleanliness, both spiritual and physical, there's no way these people could ever get to the temple. It was illegal, yet alone they didn't even have jobs. You're not going to hire a leper. He's required by law to be outside in a leper colony. And the priests were required by law to try to heal him. But do you think they ever did? No. Their society became an us and them. Where they began to look at these sinful people and place them over there. And these people are craving justice. Craving a Savior, craving the Messiah, craving something, someone to talk to me. And the only thing they get is the religious elite constantly telling them they're not good enough. By law, they had to walk around and the lepers would have to cry out, unclean, unclean, don't come near. I don't know what the psych effect does to someone that has to do that, but I imagine it's terrible. And suddenly in this moment, this guy comes along and this sentence flipped society on its head. Yes, that sentence. It's a very political statement if you're thinking in America, you're not getting it. But in Jewish society, suddenly, pureness. The lamb that I couldn't afford because I'm a leper. The pigeon I could never get to. The temple that was so far away. And suddenly this guy tells me, I have a possibility of being pure. I'm the guy that has to go around yelling unclean. 
And you're telling me that there's a possibility that I can be pure. Are you starting to see why they came on the mountaintop to hear this? Because it's something they were craving. It's something that was good news after all. And he continues because he says, Blessed are the pure in heart. (laughs) In a religious society, or maybe our society, it's easy to have those we can look at and say they are the bad people. Secretly, it's nice when I drive past the homeless guy and I can at least say I'm not him. What did you do? So the the Pharisees were no different. They liked having the lepers. They liked having the paralyzed. They liked having the people that were lesser and lower and they were scum. Because a society runs on people like that. And in this moment, in this sentence, Jesus releases the oppressed and the enslaved. Because he says, you don't have to do this stuff anymore. You're not bound anymore. You're not unclean. The first thing he says in Matthew 8, if you read it, to the leper, he says, go, you are clean. Can you imagine the outrage of the Pharisees? There's this moment where Jesus talks about a stupid cup. (laughs) I call it a stupid cup. Where Jesus says, you're so consumed with the outward appearance of the cup, and you don't even realize that the inside is disgusting. And what he's saying is our hearts. Jesus really didn't care, nor do I think God really care what the Pharisees did. And once again, in this one sermon, Jesus talks about prayer and how these pharisaical people would be like, look at me. And they would do their acts of righteousness for everyone to see. Because it wasn't about what I do at home and or in my heart. It was about how people perceived me. And in this moment, these people are freed. Now, in any society, any culture in history, read your textbooks, you'll find out what happens when someone frees the enslaved or the impressed. What do the masters do? They're going to come after you with vengeance. And what do you think the Pharisees did? They came at him with vengeance. They wanted him dead because in this moment, he put everyone on equal ground. Maybe even more so, Jesus is saying these people, these pure people in heart, because I don't know about you, in their society, they felt so distant from God. They knew they couldn't get to the temple, yet alone get a job. So what do you think their hearts are like? They understood to get close to God, I have to have something Their society, everyone believed. So these people, the only thing they had was the inward appearance. And what did Jesus constantly say to these people when he interacted with them and healed them? Go, your blank has made you well. Your faith. See, these people believed every word this guy said because it's the only thing they had. Because in this moment, there was a a Messiah, a king figure coming around, the fact that he even touched them is a miracle. The second miracle is that they were healed, that they were clean. So the religious elite hated this statement because they worked their tails off to appear righteous. And now suddenly none of that matters because it's the pure in heart? You got to be kidding me. You gotta be kidding me. And unfortunately, our offensive Jesus, our Lord and King, doesn't stop there. If you read Matthew 5 8, it goes, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. See, in our society, we assume that means what? When are we gonna see God? Heaven. In Jewish society, they would have not even thought of that. In Jewish society, you know what they're thinking about? This guy named Moses, who is a hero to all of them. Who what happened when Moses asked to see God's face? He said, God was like, no, but you can watch me walk by. And what happened to Moses' face? It was so bright 
that he had to wear a veil for people to look at him. And in this moment, these people know this story. They're, they're sitting there thinking, so wait a second, I'm blessed if I'm pure in heart and that gives me the option for my face to glow. No, 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 Jesus, you don't understand. I'm a leper. I have bleeding sores. I'm sitting here bleeding as you preach. My paralyzed friend, there's no other way that I can see God. There's something I did. These religious rulers won't even let me near the temple. And you're telling me I'm the one that's going to wear a veil. Do you realize how excited these people are in this moment? That suddenly there was good news again. These people are thrilled and the religious people can only do one thing. Let's kill this guy off. Because with them gone, people might start examining us. profound. Because it's easier to appear righteous. All of us, our hearts are wicked. Paul gives us a hint when he says, for all have fallen short. It's not an us and them, it's just us. And so really, I say all that to ask the question of where are you tonight? Are you the the bleeding guy who's got so many wounds that you're just sitting there in this chair like, I should not be here. You're like the leper that snuck into the temple somehow, bleeding out like, oh, when are they going to find me? We're not that place. Welcome. There's no stones in our, our chairs that we're going to throw at you because you're not supposed to be here. Or maybe you're on the other side, and somehow you think you're super holy, and you won't give those people a shot, because they're too sinful. They're too far gone. And our Jesus makes it intentional to reach out to these people, the wounded, the lost, the broken, the hopeless. See, I promise that one day all of us will see God's face. All of us will see Him. And the Bible tells us that every mouth will confess and every knee shall bow. But I don't know about you, but all my theology and all my thoughts and ideas on God are not going to matter when I stand before the Father in awe and I embrace the Son and just like a hug like you have no idea. I was the leper. I was the guy that was bleeding out. But you came to me. See, in a few weeks we celebrate we celebrate. Do you realize what is coming up? See, not only did this guy say cool things like this, but he died for these statements. And not even that. If I died for a statement, they'd be like, cool, he's a martyr. But if I rose from the dead, you'd be like, dang, it was true. <laughs> we should take him serious. See, Palm Sunday is coming up. Who do you think was sitting there yelling, Hosanna? These people that he healed and interacted with, that he touched. And not only that, on Good Friday when they were brokenhearted, these people would have been in mourning, yet alone in Easter when they found out he was alive. And I don't know about you, but this city, this town, and the surrounding area has people that are bleeding out that need some good news. And I'll be honest, they don't think they can come here. They're like, no, 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 if you knew my story, if you knew I was unclean, you wouldn't welcome me there. That's why we have to go out and grab them and say, no, you don't understand. Because just like the mountainside had these paralyzed people, we too must carry people to Jesus. There's a story of these friends that kicked a hole in a roof. You know this one? And what did they do? They lowered their friend to Jesus. And Jesus did the rest. And honestly, as Christians, we're nothing more than just rope holders. Jesus does the rest. But if we're not willing to invite them, because I know they need some good news, and honestly, Easter is right around the corner. I get so excited thinking about it. I'm thrilled, because he is alive. But people out there, they may not literally be lepers, 
but they probably feel like it. Our society, we like them. It's an us and them. At least I'm not them. Or maybe you got a, I don't know, a neighbor named Carol. At least I'm not Carol. Well, Carol should be brought in here. Drag her in here if you have to. Because Carol needs to hear some good news. That once she was lost. That once she was unclean and she had to scream it. But now there's a God that says, blessed are you when you're pure in heart. Because you will see the face of God. I love Jesus. You haven't figured that out by now? You haven't been listening? I love him. And I'm sure you do too. But I think all of our stories, at one time we were that leper. We were that person. And whether someone in our life was a godsend that showed up, or maybe Jesus himself showed up and reminded us that we have been made pure again, that we are cleaned and cleansed, So it's a perfect opportunity. If you got a friend that's not doing anything next week, Palm Sunday is a great time to yell Hosanna. Or even Easter, it's a great time to invite a friend to remind them like, you have no idea what was accomplished not only on Good Friday, but on Easter when he rose. Let's celebrate. Let's not point fingers and say, you're over there, I'm over here. Easter's all about we are all here. I'm going to pray. God, we love you. I'm so thankful for sending, for you sending Jesus. Thank you for what was accomplished on that cross, but even more so, thank you for proving every word you ever said, every pen stroke when you conquered death. We have nothing to fear. Thank you for looking at people like me and where others may see unclean, you just see perfection because, God, you only see your son and what he accomplished. Thank you for all these people that crutched in here, the wounded that came in here, or people that have been following you forever came here. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.